Welcome to Beta Talk, a podcast where you can learn about the plumbing and heating industry and this particular season is all about renewables. It's sponsored by MCS and you can find them at mcscertified.com. I'm back down with Kenza for part two of a really, really interesting topic. We're talking about ground source heat pumps I'm with my usual guest hosts, Bonesy, Brandon and Bill. And we've also got Darren again from Kenza. Now I want to pick up on sort of where we left off something about, so Darren and I come from a, from an educational background. We've both taught in colleges, Darren from Kenza, and we're, we're part of the building services industry. So I know we come under the umbrella of construction, but building services is like your electricians and your plumbers and heating engineers. It's all about the services coming to your dwellings, electric, gas and water. And Darren and I have been having a chat, you know, this, the, the future could be as also like on these um, new development sites, you know, brine, is essentially a service isn't it yeah absolutely i think um if you take the concept of the shoebox in a flat or a bungalow um and take that to a grander scale so on a new development of say five six bedroom houses um for example they're going to have services coming into them so they're going to have electricity they're going to have mains water and potentially gas as a service and those utilities um if you think about this you could swap the gas as a utility for a brine circuit. Now, instead of running a gas pipe around an estate delivering gas and the end user pays for the gas, you could just put a ground circuit in and um, pump brine around that from each separate heat pump within the house. And therefore it becomes more like a utility and you're using essentially your own energy off your own estate, making it far more localized. Um, Mind you, it doesn't really matter how far away it comes has to come because you like we said before you're actually still gaining energy uh, right up to the heat pump and everybody is still paying their own bill it, it seems such a simple solution to us it's also when and, and bones you know i've talked about that about that ken bones it's, it's a communal thing it's, it's like a, it's, a, it's a community thing isn't it and i think people now um in societies like this idea of community and if you're part of a green sort of community, I think this is a this is a good answer, isn't it? Yeah, I think it, I personally think it's a great solution for a lot of developers, um, a lot of estates, a lot of places where they're going to build a lot of houses. They're going to put something in anyway. You know, a lot of the time they're paying a hell of a lot of money to get the gas in, the gas service brought into those properties. Let's spend that money and put it into their own ground array on their own doorsteps. Mm. Use that energy there. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you've got to build the road infrastructure into the estate or, or the close. Um, it's it's a very simple um, utility, actually. You know, it's, it, it's because you haven't got to tap into the network further down the line somewhere else in the town. And um, we all know about, you know, any, any of us in the industry know how sometimes that can work out or not work out and fixing leaks and various things. But keeping it locally... Um, it it makes sense. It's it's a great idea. So, uh, I want to talk about. Uh, so I'm sponsored by MCS, and now your I know your company is very very good at the MCS paperwork. Now we've we've discussed in in previous uh, episodes how it can be a bit of a nightmare and a quagmire for some people. I mean, you're you're very competent with what you do. I want to sort of talk about the renewable heat incentive. Has that affected your industry in any way? Yeah, I think in a, a few years ago um, that when the RHI, the Renewable Heat Incentive, um, it it didn't have a lot of direction from the government, it wasn't set up correctly, Um, it put a lot of people off because the thing with ground source heat pumps, they are expensive. There is a ground array that becomes your battery, essentially that you've got to pay up front for. Um, You then have a payback system where the government pays you back for over seven years. as providing that you meet the MCS standards. Now, the indecision about the the, the value of that um, against what you are, what you are putting in. So, a lot of the time, it wouldn't pay itself back if you're doing boreholes. It, it didn't seem cost effective. Um, we had other things against us, like the price of oil. If that would drop, you know, all of a sudden somebody wouldn't buy a heat pump. They'd be saying, "Ah." Oh, I can get my oil a bit cheaper. I'm going to limp on another year with an oil boiler. You know, there's lots of things. That and the RHI did set us back for for a lot of the time. I think now that the RHI is right where it should be, 
MCS has become a little bit simpler. So MCS is the standards that we have to make sure these systems are designed, installed, and commissioned to. Um, just to add, you know, a, a decent quality to to the workmanship, if you like, is a bit like your gas safe in your off tech. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Brandon, I'm gonna. You and I are well known for being solar thermal advocates, and, and, and if you actually go to Kenza's website and, and sort of read about heat pump technology, you'll see in the first sentence they say how it's solar energy, and I really, really loved and valued that because I, I'm a big advocate of solar thermal. It just makes sense. We live in a solar thermal system. Yes, use as much of this solar thermal energy as we can, and obviously that's what ground source is. It's mm -hmm. solar thermal energy, and we can also use this. Yes, quite often people refer to it as geothermal, which is a whole different, different thing, thing, isn't it? Altogether, yeah, that's yeah. A, a higher temperature. That's you know. And we're going to have an episode located. about geothermal coming up with uh, someone that's been involved in a project. There's a lump of land I'm trying to buy at the moment in Wales. Um, so we're talking about brine and how this goes to these shoe boxes now. Or, or any other heat pump. I mean, any, any other, other heat, pump. heat pump. Now, this brine absolutely. can have its temperature increased with solar thermal. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's something that I'm playing with presently. I'm trying to find somebody who's prepared to give me a lot of money and bolt it into their house. Um, I, I quite like the idea of using the solar thermal, uh, having a buffer or volumizer on the return to the heat pump, and using the solar thermal to increase the temperature of that brine. Now, of course, the, the warmer that brine is, or the closer it is in the temperature coming in to that which I want going out, what we refer to as the delta T, so the difference between the flow in and the flow out, the less energy it takes to get there. So therefore, the warmer I can get the brine going into a heat pump, the less energy I require to meet a, a flow temperature going out. Now, I was given a figure by someone a while back, I've not verified it, but it kind of makes sense to me, which is every three degrees I can raise my brine temperature is the equivalent to adding one kilowatt to the heat pump. So one kilowatt of, of power to the heat pump, um, but without increasing the energy input, obviously the energy has come in the brine rather than in the electrical energy. So it's it's a, a net sum gain. Um, I was chatting with uh, Stuart, our mate Stuart, the ice sculptor. He isn't here again, and um, and I know that he's looking at playing with it, uh, changing his system about, actually doing a similar thing. He's not running a heat pump though presently. He's on a um, a gas boiler, but um, he's looking at running his solar thermal for his domestic hot water in the summer, but in the winter diverting it to a, a preheat buffer. Um, and that would be going through a gas boiler, but basically to the same ends. So just to explain for, for the layperson exactly how that works. So you've got your brine coming in, and it, come, it comes in to what? Uh, in, in this instance, probably a buffer or a, a volumizer, we might call it, if it was just on the return. It goes around a coil or directly into the buffer? Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Uh, it's kind of moot at this point. I know we've had this discussion before. It doesn't really matter. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put free energy, when there's there to be harvested, into that brine in order that we get a net sum gain is what we're I think, after doing. I think, Nathan, it's important to remember that compressors don't like much more than 20 degrees coming in mm. yep. at mm. that point. Mm. And what also we call the, the operating envelope. Absolutely. Your temperatures yeah. have always got to be within the operating but envelope. But that's why this is brilliant technology for the way everyone says you can't have solar <laughs> thermal in the winter. Well, you can on a clear day and you can just raise and make a few degrees you have a buffer and you're raising it by a few degrees and then that is actually massive or massively beneficial to then raise your brine that then goes into your heat pump. Well, yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not talking about obviously taking up 60 degrees or anything, but it's just if we can lift those temperatures, yeah, far hmm. be it for me to blow us out of, of warranty range. But, but here, it's a way in which other, we can do it. By using the, the, the brine circuit, which is buried in the ground, you're we can storing the too. heat in the ground. Yeah, the other thing to remember there, though, is that as you start to put heat back into the ground, the ground starts to dry out and move away from the pipework. So it does have a bit more of an effect of coming when it's got to return back into that ground ray. Okay, so bear in mind that you could make more particles as you put heat into that. It's going to separate away from the ground ray. Yeah, that, that makes okay. a lot of sense, yeah. So I think like all like of we, these, there are limits to, the, to what you can do. There are limitations, do, but so you have managed to be aware of the limits. Absolutely. But coming back to the point that... Um, Nathan made about solar energy. It's solar energy stored in the ground. If you think about that, the over the summer is when we're resting the heat pump predominantly mm -hmm. because it's only operating for a couple of hours a day in hot water. So there's your solar energy that's rested. But in the winter in this country, it rains a hell of a lot. And that rain is what really transfers the energy mm -hmm. into the pipe work. As we know, mm -hmm. water is a great conductor. Mm -hmm. Which is why we love a water-to-water -water heat pump. Even better. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to this sort of uh, the community thing, how, um, I mean, you're doing great things as it is, Kenza. I mean, is there anything uh, the industry can do as a whole to disseminate this message further? 
and get more and more people really understanding this technology for their own communities. Yeah, that's that's quite a big subject, to be fair. But I think the way Kenza have looked at um, developing installers, even you know end users' knowledge, you find that an end user understands the system and appreciates the system. We'll go and tell the neighbours. They're kind of teaching our. They're, they're out there preaching it basically, and what we find is that if you've got um, installers that just want to go off and buy the kit from us and off you go, take it away, I know what I'm doing, and they don't ask any questions, nine times out of ten, that goes pear shape. So, I mean, to be fair, I mean, so, so I think installers could find this as an easy transition because, I mean, at the, at the moment, installers have to know an incredible amount of knowledge. I mean, but these the shoebox systems, I don't need no flues, there's no condens- condensate to worry about, there's no <laughs> PRV pipe work to worry about. It's actually quite a, once they get the head rounds, Round it, it's actually quite simple for them, isn't it? That's it's almost really what makes easy. it so confusing, isn't it? Is the fact that it can it really be that easy? It's smoke <laughs> and mirrors, isn't it? It's it's not understanding. I think the minute you come to Kenza, the point we get out to all these installers is this is really simple. These are British made bits of kit. They're made for British homes and they're designed for British installers who understand real basic stuff it is really really basic fitting a heat pump's like if you could fit a bath or a basin you you can plumb in a heat pump the design's the difficult bit that's the bit we deal with that's the bit we get involved with very early stages can you say that again get that right because that's the problem that we see time and time again is actually people can fit the heat pumps but they haven't got a scooby do how to do the design and that's what lets it down that's what brings heat pumps a bad name these people you hear about they're spending 200 quid a week running the heat pipe and the house ain't warm and yeah that you've seen them ken i've seen them yeah. I dare say you've seen them as so, well. Bill. All the time. How's yeah. that happening? How's that been allowed to happen? It's because they're allowed to go and buy a heat pump. Kenza don't allow that to happen. It literally will not sell your heat pump if that is if we don't fully understand first who's installing it, and then they pretty much sign a contract to say that they will install it to our standards, to MCS standards, and then they provide photographic evidence of that. And when we've one hundred percent check that system over and commission that system with them over the phone and we're 100 percent happy that that do you get involved abso- in commissioning absolutely yeah okay, From I mean, Ken, every, you, every you're, 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 you, you, you know all sorts of um manufacturers within this is that well we've we've talked about this in the in is that the going on everywhere does i mean do, do all manufacturers get involved in commissioning no no, um, it's, it's quite refreshing to hear today from Kenza uh, on their process actually um, we still have a lot of manufacturers that will um, not be quite um, so helping in in design and and installation. So yes, you can actually get um, guys, engineers, companies that are, and we've already discussed this, I know, but uh, you know, are literally throwing them in. They think it's a gas boiler. They're not doing anything with the existing system. Uh, maybe a quick clean out. Um, the phone the systems in and then you know six months down the line the customer's coming back saying this is Chuck costing me a fortune what's going on and and then the the whole blame game starts to come into effect it is improving we know we know companies that are, are good uh, at, at doing this Kenza obviously from what we're hearing today is definitely one of those companies that are, are leading the way in quality installation and um, yeah it's a good thing Keep, I think it, keep it coming. If I could just add another aspect is the the controls. Both the, the installer and the end user has to understand how to use the controls properly. My experience is that they don't. They're still trying to run them as a high temperature boiler. So it's well, room led, which is heat this room up until it's too hot and then let it switch off and get it too and cold. Also expect it to and then switch it back on again. A high temp heat and room. exactly, very quickly. Yeah which is rather like driving your car with your foot on the accelerator as going as fast as you can until you get to the traffic lights and slamming the brakes on, which you all know is going to use the most fuel. Rather than taking it steady, getting it up to the temperature that you want to keep it at, and letting the heat pump just regulate the temperature by circulating the water just at the right temperature rather than on-off. And that's the concept that the installers don't understand. The, The end users don't. They, they tend to be th- thinking the same way as before. Oh, my, my boiler's always on. I can see it on the control. It's always on. It must be using a lot of power. 
most of the time, it's just using the pump to circulate the lukewarm water around the circuit. The heat pump's kicking in every now and again using very little power. But it's getting that across. The installer has to understand it and then also get it across to their customer, the, 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 the user. So there's this process of getting our knowledge through to the installer who will then pass it on to the end user. That's part of the problem that we have. How do we resolve that problem? Better Education. training. Mm. Better training of the installer. I think as well when someone purchases a heat pump, I think at that point it's really important to get a, a level of knowledge from the end user because a lot of the time they've researched the product, uh, they know a little bit about what a heat pump is and they think they know what they're buying. But if you get involved and actually talk to them, you can explain a lot of that initially before they've even put pen to paper and ordered a heat pump. And that has a massive effect on how much technical support you need to offer in the future because you've kind of paid it forward. You've done it up front already. My so you've already educated. <laughs> this is something I, I'm, I'm sure that Kenza do this because you have control over your whole process. You're doing it the correct way. There are a lot of, a lot of people out there who aren't getting that level of service. Somebody's had an idea. They're building a new house. They want to be green, so they 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 look for a heat pump. They go to a, a supplier of the heat pump. And say, I want one of your heat pumps, and then they find um, a plumber and an electrician to carry out the installation. But nobody's really in charge of it. And then there may be an overriding umbrella scheme which is providing the the MCS cover for it. But not everybody is as diligent and making sure that the whole process is taken care of. And those bad heat pump installations, the, the, the people with heat pumps that don't know how to run them, are generally giving heat pumps a bad name because they're costing a lot to run simply because of the way they're set up. Yeah, agreed. We do see that. We've seen, um, we've seen heat pumps uh, replacements where they've had a system before. And they've said, look, it's not been fantastic. Um, can you come out? Can you, can, we just want another heat pump. Can we buy one from you? We, we've heard yours are okay. Can we buy one from you? And it's like, hang on a minute. Let's go back. Let's have a look at what, what you've been seeing. Ah, okay, so you haven't had your rads oversized. Your ground array's undersized. You've been mm -hmm. using an immersion. It's like, you know, that system to us has just been sold and not yeah. been thought about or designed. Not designed or engineered. And someone's just gone in there and fitted it, and that's what gives I mean, the, the reality is that name. actually, pretty well all the units on the market are going to do the job well if they're put in correctly and they're set up correctly and there's good commissioning and understanding of how Yeah, that's something down yeah. on an I mean, a heat yeah. 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 Can, It doesn't matter obviously. whose badge is on the front. You can obviously yeah. have... Uh, perhaps better components inside but, but essentially it's a, a heat pump is a heat pump it's about the service uh, and, the, that, and the design and and the help you get with that um and, and, and my worry is as these become more popular um i mean I'll, well they will just be they'll be slung in i mean people but you're you know, going to get a big market uh, emerge like the gas boiler market way. emerged and everyone dived into it and then all of a sudden they realize oh we, we better got to make sales otherwise we collapse mm -hmm. and then you start to get your problems and if, as these start to get popular, people see the common sort of sense behind the technology. If we start to see a, a market where everyone's diving into, that's that, that's going to create some issues, I think. Well, we've already we've already seen it and are seeing it. You know, some some larger house building companies or or larger companies as a as a whole have a lot of buying power. So, if they go to a manufacturer and say, "We want to buy your product." and that manufacturer say, well, actually, you need to tick these boxes and jump over these hurdles before we sell you a product. Unfortunately, they may go to another competitor that is not as diligent as as, uh, um, uh, as has been said. So, As a manufacturer, how do you mitigate that then, uh, Darren? I mean, how you, well, you it's about having a good relationship with your end user. Um, we don't try and sell a heat pump. It actually... You know the lead the lead nine times out of ten will come to us and it's it's not a case of selling it as such it's more making sure it's actually going to do what we want it to do when it's sold you know and that somebody's actually going to bother to put it in properly because if we get the sense that someone just wants to buy a heat pump and they're going to you know stuff it in a property down a road and they're not prepared to give us any details then we won't sell them a heat pump that's so very refreshing it to really hear is, <laughs> It really is, you know, at the end of the day, we, what we it's don't want to do... to hear, actually. Yeah, yeah. 
We don't want to stick a heat pump in someone's house. Brandon, one of my top engineers, about. has just destroyed his microphone oh, setup, so uh, you might hear him go a little bit offline at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill, what, um, you've been in this industry quite a long time. You've yep. seen all sorts of aspects of it, and you sort of saw the the enthusiasm around it a few years ago, and that sort of never sort of. Uh, yeah, in two thousand and six, I I got into the industry with a company who were quite major in the ground source uh, uh, side of heat pumps. Having come from a refrigeration background, I understood the technology behind it. Uh, but it took me a while to get un- to understand the the marketplace and the the heating industry generally. Whilst I understood the technology, the application is a little is so different to what I was used to. But after a few years, I got used to that, and um, I'm fascinated because I'm I'm very passionate about reducing carbon emissions because I fully accept the um, uh, the, the information from the the world scientists that we're overheating the planet and this is one way of reducing our uh, damage that we're we're creating so um, I'm very keen that heat pumps be adopted but I'm very aware that if we don't do it correctly we're going to do even more damage and we I've seen this swing to and fro in 2006 2007 we thought this is it the industry is taking off it's all happening by 2010, the whole thing collapsed again, uh, partly because of a change of government, uh, confusion as to uh, what people were doing, and a, an influx of heat pumps from uh, many uh, sources. But it was primarily being pushed by the manufacturers of those heat pumps without uh, without being driven by the, the people who really matter, who are the, the installers. The installer in the side of the industry has rather been dumbed down because instead of it being driven by a large large industry, large industry bodies who can put in the training and care about what they're doing, it's now being driven by manufacturers of components, which are then just putting the components on the market. And most of the, the guys working in it are a man in a van who have got to make a living in a very competitive world. So I've got a every sympathy for a lot of these guys because it's a hard world out there. It's a very, very much a dog-eat-dog. Dog. And they're being fed the, the components by an industry which is just trying to make sales. We, it's disconnected. Now, Kenza are different in that they're connecting all of these dots together. They've got a product and they're controlling how that goes to market all the way through to the uh, the the end user, mm. which is very refreshing, and we need to have more of that. But my feeling is we need to be driving this from the grassroots level. The installers should be driving things more than the the manufacturer. How, how do we Vive do la révolution? How do we do that as installers? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a policymaker. I, it's, we were talking about it earlier, weren't we, Bill? Downstairs, yeah. and it's it's a tricky thing. I mean, we're talking about do we need a complete inversion? Do we need, you know, the installers to be in charge? I kind of like that, um, weirdly. Or actually, do we need to just, it doesn't need to be more of a horizontal setup whereby we at least, I think the term used was, have a seat at the table and get to hear our voices, be heard. I mean, I know you've often said, Nathan, that you don't blame the installers for being, you know, untrained nitwits or whatever your term was. No, um, it wasn't. <laughs> no, that might be my paraphrase. A, he loves winding no, up, Brandon does. <laughs> but the point being that, as you say, an awful lot of installers just simply haven't been given the no, opportunity it's, it's or been understood unfair. the They've been trained very easily through the gas. I mean, uh, we were talking about Corgi earlier, yeah. weren't we? Uh, when know, I first done when, my when Corgi. When Dan did his Corgi. I mean, I, I never did my Corgi. So uh, 1991 was when I passed out, but I happened to be working on an airbase where there was a kind of war going. I was on the USAF airbase. So I don't think they worried about us engineers getting corgi trained. But, you know, my dad come from big, heavy industry. He got trained and it's, it made sense. You know, so I'm of that generation where my dad was like, you don't, you know, you don't go anywhere else house. You do not touch it now. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why I never did it. But I didn't feel responsible, actually, funny enough, at that, at that age. I didn't feel like a responsible person at 20 to sort of have. Uh, but we were talking about how on your corgi training, you had yeah. painters and decorators going on it. Yeah, absolutely. And it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. They got taught how to safely, or supposedly safely, put in a gas boiler. And what's happened is, you know, three decades on, is you get people trained in gas safety, supposedly, 
They don't get trained in engineering. They don't get trained in a, in system design or, or what types of systems. We've got lots of systems out there. They don't get trained any of this. And then all of a sudden, they're calling themselves a heating engineer, which then means, because the customer actually thinks if you're a heating engineer, you can be a plumber as well. They go out and start putting bathrooms in. Tiling can be nice. It can be looking lovely, but they don't know anything about water regulation. So we're seeing a massive problem with that. And it's created, you know, we'll say the gas industry created a problem. And I think renewables actually can uh, create a solution if we do it right, and if they start listening to installers as well. It's an opportunity. Mm, big yeah. opportunity, I think. Isn't I it? think the cost of the kit as well. You know, you look at a gas boiler, thirty kilowatt. What's what's the price average price? Six seven hundred notes for a cheap one. That's what I mean. But try and look at the cost of a thirty kilowatt heat pump. You know, and the battery that's got to go with that. You're probably <laughs> looking at heat pump. Damn, you're, you're looking big at near, near a thirty grand, aren't you? By the time you put a a ground rain against it, dug trenches and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of cost implication comes into, actually, we better start thinking about what we're doing installing this. I think that, well, naturally, so, that naturally occurs. We have to start engineering it. That's Absolutely. a crazy modern idea. Heating engineers who engineer. Mm. I'm not sure it's going to catch on, unfortunately. I'd love it to. <laughs> well, we used to be called in engineers. And we got oh, called, we're not, we're not we, got, we got called He's installers. Yeah. I mean, there is this big thing. You've got, to have a, you've got to have your degree to get called an engineer. I, I, I refute that. My dad's an engineer. He's got no degrees, and my granddad did have. But uh, you can still have an engineering brain. I'm sitting across people that have got engineering brains. Um, but, yeah, we got called installers. It got dumbed down a little bit because it was just literally banging something safe on a wall. Um but yeah, I think so. I'm trying, I, and I'm always thinking of ways installers can get involved. There's some, been some movements in the past, hasn't quite worked. I mean, Brandon and I've all, we've talked about, and I'm actually working with some people at the moment where I can get a site that monitors systems, so we can bring some accountability into it, mm. and I can probably bring on some manufacturers. So I've got some team of people working with at the moment who can monitor systems. So your good engineer will actually like that because I can have their system monitored. It proves their competency to the manufacturer and and the end user and then that gets gets them some valuable work i mean as you say i think the we are seeing a surge not a resurgence but a surge of renewable energies um i think the government figures said they want two hundred thousand installed a year by 2025 uh, which is a vast amount of heat pumps from where we are now i mean it's just huge now people are going to, have to be trained to do that um i met with mcs the other day they're looking at this as to how this can sensibly be done and how can, we can assure ensure that these guys are, and gals, I'm not sexist, I'm just lazy, so I use one word. Um, yeah, how these people are up to scratch, and actually what we're seeing are decent systems going in, they're being well designed. I mean, I love the fact I walked into your office earlier, guys, so we've got Darren and Ali here, we haven't heard from Hi. Hi. And um, uh, Ali does the MCS side, so I think maybe we should chat with her shortly, because that would be really interesting. But to walk into your office and to see actually lots of people who are, they've got drawings in front of them, they're having a look at it, they're specking stuff, and they're making sure it's going out right. Now, this is one of the beauties of a well-run umbrella scheme, in my mind, is the fact that actually you take control of it. And, I mean, I was chatting with you earlier, Ali, and you were saying that, you know, we want to see photos of the whole caboose. We want to make sure there's nothing that's wrong here. We want to see every element going in. Yeah, that's refreshing, Evan, yeah, isn't definitely it? definitely. And, and knowing that it's going to work, because that comes back to you, of course, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it of course, because it's, it's our project, and it's something that we've worked on for years, and it's something that we're proud of. And um, if it's not installed correctly, then it doesn't do good for the brand and it, it's not going to benefit the end user and that's what we want is to protect our end users and know that what they're what is being installed is going to work efficiently as we say i mean generally what happens and we see it time and time again if a system falls over or is non-performing the end user looks at the big white box and calls up the manufacturer and says it's your fault when in actual fact, it could be the guy that's plumbed it in, designed it, or lack of design, you know, not treated it um, with quality. So it is refreshing that these, these things are starting to happen. It's really good. It's, it's nice that we don't see too much of that, to be honest. Um, and getting involved. But is that a, early because doors. you put in the, you know, the effort up front? Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that reason. Put Carry the on. effort in up front, pay it forward. You get the benefit coming out the, the you know the rear end, so to speak. <laughs> in my Charming. in my previous position, <clears throat> I saw a, a lot of incidents where heat pumps were installed by somebody who was just jobbing for the builder. The plumber would connect the pipes and may fill it with water. As far as he was concerned, his job was finished. 
uh, the commissioning engineer will go to site, check it over, find in many cases no glycol or not the right amount of glycol. If it was a ground source system with a, uh, the water side on the, the heating, there'd be no inhibitor. That hadn't been flushed through. Full of dirt. Well, don't talk inhibitor, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Not in front of me. <laughs> Const- constantly clogging up the, the strainer. We always insisted that the strainer was fitted. Yeah. But we sometimes found the strainer the wrong way around, or uh, if it was a Y strainer, it would be upside down. So when it, uh, it filled up with dirt, so when you took it apart, the dirt dropped down the back down the pipework instead of being able to take it out. Uh, there would be it would be full of air. They hadn't flushed the system through, purged it. It wasn't going to work. There was no way it was going to work. But they thought they'd finished. Yeah, we we pick up on that before we commission. So what we'll do is we'll look at photographic evidence of a plant room uh, before it's commissioned. Have a look at that. If there's any bits and pieces that I don't seem see that look look okay to me, then we we pick up on it and we get it put right before it's commissioned. And what we say about strainers, especially on the ground side, is don't fit a strainer. Use a strainer, a hand strainer, and chuck away anything that you might catch. While you're purging it. While you're purging it. Mm. Fill and purge with a hand strainer, get rid of that crap. You've then not got a flow restriction in line. Okay? If you want to fit one and leave it in, just take leave it in for a couple of weeks and take the mesh out. And take the gauze out, yeah. Absolutely. The heat, the heat exchangers are robust enough. Um, to take a certain amount of debris but if you can fill and purge that correctly um, and and get that out at point of filling and purging then even better for the system I think what you were referring to though was the heating side weren't you? The heating side yeah, yeah. yes Just not being mostly the heating side full of flux and cack and do you get involved yep. in the heating side like on your commission process? On the commission then what what we look at obviously the readings oh. on the heat pump but I then get the guys to go around and check the flow temperatures, make sure they've got temperature going to each circuit and all the rest of it. I'm going to bring up that topic that Bill just mentioned, inhibitor, because one, one of the things I'm trying to get involved, or which I think the renewables actually can help us with, is VDI 2035, the way the Germans do it. Because in this country, it's just all about inhibitor, and you know, the inhibitors went on the shelves on the market when I was born, 71, and we've still got corrosion problems. And I think that's another area that uh, the renewables can actually look at because the boiler companies are in very, very much embedded with chemical companies. So I think renewable manufacturers can actually say, well, is there a different way of doing this then and protecting, cro- uh, you know, protecting our heat uh, emitters from corrosion? And there are. There, there are. And I've got some people flying over from Germany on the 17th to discuss that um, because we should be using the techniques that we know are good, uh, not just sticking with the old guard um, just because it, it makes m- lots of money yeah. for lots of people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, I mean, I might actually have a chat with you about That'd that. That'd be really and, good. And Because uh, there is other ways we can prevent corrosion, because corrosion is a big problem, a very big problem. I want to bring Ali back into this. I was mentioning to Ali that um, I'm going to be at uh, Future Build, which is on the 3rd and uh, 3rd to 5th of March, if you're listening to this bef- prior to that, and where you'll be able to speak with the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, you'll be able to speak with MCS, they've got a zone called Future Installer, and I think you're going to come along to that as well, Ali, and have a little chat if, with people that are interested in, in heat pumps and heat pump technology, because I think it's open to sort of basically uh, the, the, a wider sort of cohort of people, you know, the, the people that are interested in having these put in their own homes. Um, so if you want to meet uh, Ali and I there and all the others that are involved in heat pump technology and the MCS people and the Solar Trade Association are going to be there as well, which is good for me. I like to see that on the solar thermal side, I might add as well. Um, Ali, you have been involved in sort of the MCS. Pro- you, you, you've been, uh, where did you come from before you come from Kenza? Um, before I come from uh, to Kenza, I used to work um, for an anaerobic digestion plant, um, dealing with the MCS and their renewable we, heat we're dealing incentives. With their ship. Yes, literally. Um, you might <laughs> be. Uh, so that was it's very different. Are we allowed to say where that was, or are you allowed to? Or um, I'm not know, too sure, to be honest. I know my um, <laughs> local brewery, uh, Adnams, as a as a digestion plant. Um, I'm not sure if it switched on yet, but um, yeah, they had they had their own plant. Yeah, it was a um, it was a company called Exora. Um, so they are they've got a few plants around the country um, and so yeah I worked I worked with them and it is it's very different to go in from 
looking at the MCS from that perspective and then coming to ground source heat pump. So there is definitely a variation, but you've also got everything that's everything's pretty much standard, but then you've got the variations. Um, and prior to that, I worked for EDF Energy for 12 years um, and I worked with in the carbon reduction commitment and um, business planning and that kind of thing. So I've got, so I've got a bit of, um, got a, nice got a bit of knowledge. Yeah, I have got a bit of knowledge, but um, I think def- certainly coming within the ground source heat pump industry, it's the way forward and it's definitely the direction that I wanted to go in. Um, and there is so much potential out there and I think it is Are you local the to the forward. area where Kenza are based or have you had to sort of travel for this? Um, I just travel um, 12 miles up the road every day. Oh, right. <laughs> That's right. So it? not yeah. too far. Yeah. It's a bit closer than I come today. A bit closer <laughs> than my train journey uh, uh, going back. I um, think what I like with, with working with Kenza is that we are, we are very much like people, people, people. And we like to work with our installers. We want them to um, get educated and we want to help them because, and we want to learn from them as much as they learn from us. Yeah, I just saw a heat pump. There was one screw and you could take the whole case off with one screw. The only question is, like, if you've got six screws and you lose one, it's all right, isn't it? But what if you've only got one and you lose it? <laughs> I love the fact there's only one screw. That's genius. <laughs> oh, it doesn't need it. Oh, it's only a tether. But I just thought that, yeah, that you were saying that that was, you know, the installers have come back to you and said, oh, man. I mean, I know your old units that had the little three mil Allen keys and there's half a dozen to get in the front of it to do anything. Mm. So I quite like that. Genius. And with MCS, we'll try and make it as straightforward as possible for them um, and provide them any support that we can. There's only so much that we can do, but as much as we can support them, we certainly will. So what are your conditions to become to work under your umbrella, if you're happy to say it here? I guess you are. Um, we want to ensure that you've got, you've got qualifications. Mm. So we want to make sure that you're qualified to um, have the unvented cylinders you want we want to make sure that you it's going to be safe and also that you're going to have the electrical sign off certificate um if we're working with installers um we do like to see their work and we like to see that they're um they're do you mind if those photos are competitors um no no not at all (laughs) not at all as long as you're going to buy a kenza heat pump we don't mind (laughs) Um, so do you carry a a list of those and you advertise a list of those or leads come into you do you pass them on we yeah we'll pass them on so we've got we do have um installers all across the country and um it all depends on the type of job as to what installers um will put forward for it Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's just about developing the network i think um and the more that happens and we've talked quite a lot about your shoebox unit which is either three or six kilowatt how how high do you what's your range of units that you do the range of units i think darren that's probably <laughs> yeah so we can make anything up to a megawatt really um, we do a range of plant room modules from 25 to 75 uh, kilowatt uh, domestically we can go up to currently we got uh, 24 kilowatt single phase Certainly single phase yeah yeah single phase um yeah, we do 30 kilowatt uh, twin unit, three phase, and we do a couple of hybrid models. We've got the range of Evos, and we've obviously got the smaller smaller ones, but a lot of the time for the bigger projects, we'd cascade units. Mm-hmm. You know, the benefits of cascading, why turn on 75 kilowatts of compressor if you can turn on 25? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, You've got two rooms calling for heat, why turn on a massive compressor if you can actually use a lot less power turning on a small one? I'm with you on that all the way. I like that's a good bit of And that's better than using a, uh, an inverted driver, large compressor, running it at a part capacity. But they're more efficient running at that capacity, aren't they? Yeah, yeah with, well, compressors run at, uh, like engines, they have a sweet spot mm-hmm. when they're running at the most efficient. So when you have a variable speed, some of the time it's not running at its highest efficiency. But with the fixed speed, it always runs at its optimum efficiency. Yeah, I think the thing to remember as well with inverters is that even though you might be saving a little bit of power inverting, you, you're going to run for longer if you're putting less energy in. Agreed. Um, so your pumps are running. You, you're paying for extra pumps to run. You know, I think inverters as well. They, you know, without getting too deep into it, I think they've been prone to breaking down fairly regular. If you've got the life of a, a heat pump that we like to think 25 years, you probably do two inverters. They're going to be expensive to replace, hard to come by. Um, 
yeah, we looked at inverters a long time ago and we tested them and all the rest of it. I mean, they naturally, in the way that they invert, they waste power. Um, That's so, why always warm. Yeah, so, you <laughs> know, I mean, we've got you know, nothing you, against the, them. The, the HVAC source. industry switched over to inverters a well, while back, didn't they? This is interesting because I was in the, uh, the industry before inverters were introduced. I was aware of in, inverters uh, in use on pumps and fans, but... Um, I was there when we switched over from fixed speed compressors to variable in the air conditioning industry. And the, the purpose of them wasn't to increase the efficiency. It was so that they could introduce air conditioning into domestic environments because it reduced the starting current for a start, but it also reduced the sound perception. So when you start up with an inverter, it starts up slowly, ramps up, and then it can ramp down. Previous uh, compressors would start at, well, a fixed speed compressor, it's on, then it's off. No, no, no. And it's you notice it. On. It's wallop <laughs> with, on. With, with, uh, with uh, capacitors. Even, well, this was before soft starters. Right, <clears throat> yeah, soft starters help. Soft starters have come along and they have improved vastly over the, the last uh, 20 years that I've been working with them and the well, earlier versions on heat pumps, though. Soft start. yes and that's not due to the, the the soft starter or the heat pump it's mainly due to the poor quality of the power supply that oh, you've well you've that. connected it to high or low voltage <laughs> and um i think that people have got the wrong idea about inverters they think it's all about efficiency and the testing uh, routine that, that we have the I can't remember the number now, but is it uh, BSEN 15 and something and 14 something, are mainly geared up to testing the efficiency of inverter systems. And they will test them at their, their optimum point. So if you've got a 12 kilowatt heat pump, you'll find that they're actually giving you the data when it's only at 5 kilowatts, not at its maximum or its minimum. And it's not a real representation of what the, the, the device is actually doing. Whereas they have taken it away from uh, fixed speed heat pumps and the, the testing doesn't allow a fixed speed heat pump to demonstrate its ability at its optimum. Isn't this why we'd really like to monitor lots and lots of different systems in exactly the same way? Yeah, this is my this exactly compare right. them like for like. Yeah. My experience energy, of monitoring, energy, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, the heat pumps that I've been working on for the last five years have full system monitoring. Mm -hmm. You can see everything, provided the customer allows it to be connected to their mm -hmm. broadband. But I've monitored hundreds over the, uh, the, the years, and I've been able to see the difference in performance and straight away I can see a system that's working well and a system that's not. And uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's fixed speed or uh, inverter drive, although I'm not mostly able to see the, uh, the COP straight away. It's quite simple to just to monitor the length of time that the, the compressor and the whole thing has been running. And that's very simple. And you can see that uh, a fixed speed or an inverter there is very little difference. As long as the runtime is probably 10 minutes or above, then you, you've cancelled out all the benefits of a, uh, an inverter drive. And that's where that's system really volume point. helps. I'm just really going, valid I'm point. just going to mention the fact we're, we're actually uh, recording this in a college and you may be picking up some background noise because uh, <laughs> we've got some construction going on outside. And unfortunately for you guys listening, I'm not technical enough to get rid of that on my uh, software that I use. I probably could if I really learned how to do it. But um, so we're going to come to a close in a minute. So what I would like to say is we've all come down to... Has anyone been to Ken's before? Bonesy, you've been, haven't you? And Brandon's been. Yeah, Bill and I, this is the first time for us to come and visit them, isn't it? And um, I, I will sort of inculcate this. It's, it's, it's been really nice for us actually to come. We, we walked in that office this morning. It's not your... It's not what I would say is the run of the mill. What's, what I do see when I go into places, it was a lovely family atmosphere. It was great to meet. Um, so there were dogs everywhere. The, yeah, it was dog, <laughs> dog friendly, uh, Lots of dog friendly yeah. office and bicycles. Uh, very yeah, sort of, of um, parking. A family nice feel about it. Um, they, they're very obviously green. going down the right direction, um, which we need renewables to go down. Um, down, is there anything you'd like to say to sort of the listener or anyone that's sort of interested in sort of heat pump technology? Where, where can they sort of find you guys? What can they look at on your website? Where, where's your presence? 
Yeah, I think there's a great little tab on our website. Um, if anyone doesn't know the website, it's www.kensaheatpumps.com. Uh, there's a tab on there called the Knowledge Hub. Now, just click on that, have a look in there, because there's vast amounts of information. There's videos, training, um, how to do this, how to do that. There's case studies for every example that we can possibly imagine that you might need to look at someone's already done it before you know whether it be like a subway station that that called us four years ago with natural water filtration down through the subway that they they managed to catch and pump away 365 days a year clever guy there just made a quick phone call to me and said can i use that water wow yeah of course you can absolutely send us some dimensions we'll do you a sketch now they heat their offices off of wastewater that they were pumping away anyway you know situations like that they're on that website on that knowledge hub all the technical information sheets AIS sheets which are our application information sheets which have all the schematics on them you know it might be that you you want to put a swimming pool in and and you're running a district array because you've got an office office block next to it but then you've got a house and it might have an annex how do you do that go and have a look on the website because all the info's there that district array I really want to learn more about I like the way you're doing that yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of information on that as well as um, you can contact anyone at Kenzo and we'll talk to you about it and take it a lot further for you. Sounds excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Well, I'd like to thank Kenzo for being my hosts today. So that's Ali Tout and Dan Reveal. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you to my guest host, Brandon, Ken Bones and Bill Johnson. I'm sponsored or this season is sponsored by MCS and you can find them at mcscertified.com. If you do like these podcasts, please uh, follow them on your podcast platforms, whether that's Spotify, iTunes or Stitcher. And I think you can actually put feedback or you can rate them and that helps search engines pick up on them for anyone that's interested in renewables. They can find them easy and, and, and have a listen to the chats that we do. So thank you very much for listening. You can reach me at learn at betateach.co.uk if you feel there are any topics that you want us to discuss or if you want us to sort of... Uh, carry on with and once again thank you to my guests see you soon